imagine a world that is very different from today. A world where there are no public galleries full of colourful paintings. Where the old masters like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo are hardly known. Where art is considered purely decorative and the artist a mere craftsman. It's astonishing, yet this was Britain 400 years ago. Since then, great works of art have flooded onto British shores and our appreciation of art and artists has been transformed. This is the story of the private collectors who brought a wealth of treasures from overseas, whose patronage encouraged British-born artists and whose personal passion for art and individual taste helped create this cultural revolution and shape the artistic direction of our nation. In this programme, I'm going to look at how the role of collectors changed radically throughout the 19th century, kick-started by events that happened not in England, but across the Channel in revolutionary France. Revolution and war always unlocks collections. The market becomes very fluid. How Britain's first canal builder, the Duke of Bridgewater, turned from inland navigation to speculation in the art market, landing one of the greatest halls of paintings ever on British shores. How, as Britain embraced democracy, collectors began to donate art on an unprecedented scale to build our national collection. They're hoping like crazy that all these patriotic fellow countrymen will bequeath or give paintings, and that's exactly what happens. and how we moved into an era of eclecticism and variety as newly moneyed industrialists and bankers expressed their powerful personalities and individuality in their bold purchases. With pharmaceuticals magnate Thomas Holloway backing what he considered the best of British. While two Welsh heiresses brought impressionism to Britain. As collectors at the time, they were revolutionary and extraordinary that it was two women who did this. Seventeen eighty nine, the French Revolution was in full swing. Aristocratic lives were in peril. So too were their magnificent art collections, including that of the Duke of Orléans. His art collection was virtually unrivaled in the whole of Europe and had been the envy of connoisseurs around the world. It boasted Raphaels, Tintorettos, Titians, Paintings by all the great old masters. These tumultuous times would cost the Duke his head and the collection its home. Old masters like these had been the most coveted prizes sought after by the English collectors for the past 200 years. Now, this amazing cachet of paintings would go to the highest bidder and a group of British aristocrats conceived an ingenious plan of forming a syndicate to be sure of outbidding their rivals. These canny lords were the Duke of Bridgewater, the Earl Gower and the Earl of Carlisle. For the three men, the sale of the Orléans collection was a chance to purchase the greatest single group of masterpieces to come on the market for 200 years. This is Castle Howard in Yorkshire and was home to the 5th Earl of Carlisle, one of the partners in the syndicate. Carlisle and Gower were both already enthusiastic collectors. Carlisle had been on a grand tour. He took his dog with him and came back with a fine collection of Italian art. Gower had served as ambassador in Paris and so would have been well aware of the Orléans collection. Bridgewater's enormous wealth came from his development of a canal system, and he was, by all accounts, less erudite. On his grand tour, 
It was said that he was more interested in the Languedoc Canal in France than in the art on display. Nevertheless, he could spot the opportunity to turn a profit, whether in industry or paint. Archivist Chris Ridgway has some documents that tell the tantalizing story of the Orléans sale. It's called the Bridgewater Syndicate because it's named after the principal um, stakeholder in that, which is the Duke of Bridgewater. I mean, the very rich canal builder, uh, famous from the second half of the 18th century. But the Duke of Bridgewater is, is only one of the three men. So Francis, Duke of Bridgewater, Frederick, Earl of Carlisle, here of Castle mm -hmm. Howard, and Bridgewater's nephew, George Earl Gower. Those are the three men who form the syndicate. And this, and this document here is, is their agreement, is it? It's, it's a handwritten memorandum of agreement um, agreement. outlining all, as it were, the, the participants, uh, crucially the stakes that they put in, the sums. So Bridgewater puts in £27,000, Carlisle puts in £10,000. Um, and Gower puts in £5,000. And then there's a bit of preamble, and then, crucially, you've got the signatures yeah. and their seals. Uh, so this is a splendid. legal document as well as a memorandum of understanding. And this is a really new step, isn't it, in art collecting? Because this sort of thing hadn't really happened in Britain before. It doesn't seem to have happened in Britain before in relation to art. As I say, no. in the commercial mm. world, this is probably, you know, going on every day of the week. But this seems to be one of the earliest instances where they're doing this with a bulk of paintings mm. rather than, say, commodities or tea or something like that. What they did with the paintings then was quite novel, wasn't it? Because they actually exhibited some of them, didn't they? Well, that's the key to them being able to sell them and get their money back. So uh -huh. they had to go on sale uh, in London. This yes. is the schedule of all the paintings. Tintoretto continued. Yeah. Titian, Titian yeah. all these Titians. My Veronese, Veronese here, Velasquez here. I mean, yes. this is a roll call of European art. I it mean, is. the great masterpieces of Europe. And here they all are in London, yes. en masse, available for people to see, and even better, available for people to buy. buy. When the syndicate put the collection on exhibition, it was so vast that it needed to be housed in two venues. The show lasted for seven months, causing huge public excitement. But for the syndicate, the point of putting these great old masters on show was not to open up art to the public, but to sell it. The three men reserved the paintings they wanted to keep and through the sale of the rest of them, pulled off an amazing coup. They acquired their own pictures at virtually no cost to themselves. Speculating on art, had clearly worked. And today, Castle Howard is still home to some of the works that the ingenious and entrepreneurial Carlyle acquired from the sale. The Earl's descendant, Simon Howard, retains a delight in the art his ancestor bought, not least this exquisite work by Titian. It's oh, beautiful. It's called Gaston de Foy and his page, and it's rather beautiful, you know, with the page boy beautiful. dressing the warrior. Um, the green velvet is fantastically painted. This must be one of your favourites in the collection. It mm. is. It's got a charm about it that I think is wonderful. I mean, you look at the working of the green velvet in the page boy and yes. the reflection in the armour and the, the look on both Those faces. Those lovely it's expressions. Wonderful, I just love yes. it. And it's, um, you know, it's one that um, I've known all my life and always been interested in because of the, the whole debate about who it's by. Currently, it's attributed to the young Titian, is yes. it? Yes, yes, it is. And so it would have been the fifth Earl of Carlisle who bought this. Indeed. And he clearly would have been attracted to it, as he was to many of the old master paintings in that sale. He was, and uh, he was a great collector, and he had a great eye, and um, what he brought into this house really was probably some of the most important paintings in the house that we have. So um, that particular collection, the Orléans sale, was that, did that really change the collection here? Well, put it this way, they named a room, a room after it. Oh, well, <laughs> They yes, hung most of them in one room and called it the Honor Room. Today, only the Earl's portrait remains in this room. And now most of the paintings from the Orléans sale are in the music room. The Titian isn't the only work where the attribution has changed over the years. Today, this painting is thought to be by the Italian painter Bedoli, 
but this was not always the case. At the time of the Orléans sale, this painting was catalogued as the Dukes of Ferrara by Tintoretto. And one of the really fascinating things about it is its probable journey here. The Dukes of Ferrara were one of the great collecting dynasties of 16th century Italy at a time when Italy was at the epicentre of art and collecting. By the 18th century, it had arrived in France and become part of the Orléans collection. And by the beginning of the 19th century, it was here at Castle Howard as the British moved to the forefront of art collecting. In many ways, the Orléans sale marked the pinnacle of the British aristocratic collector. Up to this point, the landed gentry had been the ones with the money and appetite to buy such a wonderful collection. But within the triumph of this sale, there were clues as to how collecting would change as Britain became a more democratic nation. For the last few decades, there had been a growing fashion for the middle classes to visit great country houses, to view their art in situ. But rather than the people having to seek out the collection, the Orléans show brought the collection to the people. In doing so, it whetted the appetite for art amongst the wider population. Now a new kind of collector came through the doors, men made rich by industry and banking. These newly moneyed collectors saw the value of art and its power to endorse their cultural credentials. One of the chief buyers at the Orléans sale was a John Julius Angerstein, a Russian émigré who made his fortune as a merchant and Lloyd's underwriter. And it would be Angerstein's collection, rather than that of a British aristocrat, that would make an historic contribution to the story of art in Britain because it was his collection that would form the basis of our National Gallery in 1824. The idea of a National Gallery had been in the air for a few decades. In an age that was beginning to embrace democracy, calling for the rights of all men and women, there was a growing opinion that perhaps art should be available to more than just a handful of rich collectors. The idea had been discussed in Parliament, but had come to nothing. Then Angerstein's death in 1823 forced the issue. This journey from private drawing room to public display is charted in the archives of the National Gallery and Susanna Avery Quash is the curator of private collections. The Angerstein collection, consisting of 38 pictures, was purchased for £57,000. Various noblemen and um, aristocrats were worried that when Angerstein died, his collection would be sold abroad, as other collections had been in the past. Mm. So they pushed and they shoved and they made a loud noise, and the government, um, who had luckily been given some money from a, a war loan from Austria, used the money to buy the collection. So that is the start? That's the start of the National and Gallery. And from then, obviously, it leads to certain requests. Yes, uh, and, 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 and gifts over the, and, and certain purchases, but also they're hoping, because they don't really have an annual purchase grant mm. early on, nothing's very systematic. So they're, they're hoping like crazy that um, all these patriotic fellow countrymen will bequeath or give paintings, and that's exactly what happens. So what's fascinating to me is that the mood was really changing amongst these yes. private collectors, wasn't it, at the beginning yes. of the 19th century? They were determined to share things. They were, and, and a, a sort of almost a snowball effect. Mm. Somebody did something by gift or bequest, and then a whole stream of other people followed in succession. That's really exciting to see number one, National Gallery number one. Exactly, and what it tells us also is that it's a painting by Sebastiano del Piombo of the raising of, of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Here it is, National Gallery number one, the raising of Lazarus by Sebastiano del Piombo. It came to England via the Orléans sale, and in a way it was the very first painting to be saved for the nation. The National Gallery itself, and many of its finest treasures, are here thanks to private collectors, both past and present. 
But the fact that these individuals felt motivated to share their collections with the public signalled a new attitude towards art. This new sense of philanthropy dominated the attitude of collectors as the century progressed. In what became a huge democratisation of art, treasures like this moved out of private hands and into public ownership. And bequests came from many sources. For example, that of the Reverend Holwell Carr, who bequeathed 35 paintings, including Titian's Holy Family with a Shepherd and Tintoretto's St George and the Dragon. So now the great British public owned world-class paintings, alongside the rich and the aristocrats. But were they ready for such artworks? The archives also give an insight as to how some of the public responded to this new national institution. It's quite clear that the general public at the time didn't really have an understanding um, of an art gallery almost being like a sacred temple <laughs> to the muses and they, they should show respect yes. and, and keep quiet and so on. And um, in fact, in one of the select committee uh, reports, um, the keeper of the day noted that when he challenged some country bumpkins about why they were opening up a picnic in the middle of one of the rooms. They offered him a glass of gin. And, <laughs> what a lovely scene. Yes, and, and he also commented that um, sometimes when he went round the galleries at the end of the day, he would have to clear up little puddles because of the schoolboys, there were no facilities for um, relieving themselves and so they would just do so in the corners of, of, of the art galleries. <laughs> There was still a long way to go before the National Gallery became the experience it is today. But this changing attitude to art reflects the seismic social and political changes of the 19th century. In 1832, the Great Reform Act was passed. It extended the franchise and changed constituency boundaries to reflect the growth of new towns and industrial centres. But most significantly, it began to question the assumption that the old aristocracy were born with the right to rule. If more of the population had a stake in running their country, then everyone from mill workers and factory workers upwards had a right and need for education. And art appreciation was seen as a crucial part of a good education. Industrial cities were springing up all over the place and were seen as the symbol of a new age. Progress was becoming a catchword for Victorian Britain and nowhere represented progress more than Manchester. In the late 18th century, it had had a population of just 30,000, but by the mid 19th century, it had ballooned to over 10 times that figure. Manchester's business grandees quickly matched words with wallets and established a massive £74,000 fund to host what is arguably the largest art exhibition ever to have been held in the world. The extraordinary thing about the Manchester show was that it was made up almost entirely of loans from private collections. Collections that had been built up for the past 200 years by generations of families and displayed in treasure houses that dotted the country. There were 984 lenders to the show, and emerging from their houses were priceless masterpieces that were being shown together and in public for the first time. Queen Victoria led the way, loaning 94 works, including two Rembrandts and a Van Dyck. A Madonna, lent from a private collection, was reattributed as a Michelangelo during the show, becoming known as the Manchester Madonna. And Castle Howard lent generously, including Karachi's Dead Christ Mourned. It was believed that such a show would have been impossible in any other country in the world. One critic even said it equaled the Louvre. The show attracted more than 1.3 million visitors from around the world, and although there's nothing left of the buildings that housed it, the Manchester Art Gallery has some wonderful records of this extraordinary art event, which archivist Ruth Shrigley has researched in detail. It was clearly a huge success.
it and, was. And it yes. did something that had never really been done before, which was bring the public in to see art. In vast numbers. And it was, at the time, referred to as the greatest show on earth. <laughs> it's as basic so, as that. Yes. <laughs> It feels very Victorian to record it all in this scientific way. Well, I think it, it possibly reflects the fact that Manchester businessmen and bankers were used to using figures in order to make decisions and to argue for policies, particularly in relation to social reform. That's very interesting, and this is a new thing for art, really, yes. to organise an exhibition according to these kind of factors? Well, certainly to record th th those factors and to be so keen on looking at what influences people to attend. And they could see by measuring the attendance and the type of ticket holder who was coming um, that they weren't actually getting as many people from um, the working classes who they thought would come on a cheaper ticket mm. than they'd expected. So they started an experiment partway through the exhibition of charging half price on Saturday afternoons after two o'clock. That would be the time when people who are working in the local mills and warehouses would be uh, available and, and to come was that along. Successful? Some of the more enlightened employers would encourage their workers to visit. And one, Titus Sold, organized a day out for the whole of his workforce. So over 2,000 people came. But one wonders what the quality of experience was like for people who didn't know what they were looking at. Yes. Um, because it, it was such a vast space with so many exhibits crammed into it, over 16,000 exhibits. So it must have been a very confusing visual experience. Yes. And even though the organisers had tried to arrange the paintings in groups, if you didn't know anything about art, you would have found it quite difficult. Mm. So they, it was really the first stage. They were bringing the art to the public, but they weren't really interpreting it for No, them. they weren't. Do we have any records of which were the most popular paintings in the exhibition? Yes, there are some accounts which suggest that the most popular ones were those where you didn't need to have an art historical background or knowledge. I can imagine. So um, paintings with a very strong narrative, mm -hmm. paintings which were very dramatic. So, for example, Wallace's Death of Chatterton, um, the Howling Shepherd um, by Holman Hunt, both very colourful paintings. The fact that contemporary narrative works by artists like Wallace and Holman Hunt, who were part of the new cutting-edge pre-Raphaelite movement, were in the show at all was itself groundbreaking. This was the first time that British 19th century painting was hung side by side with old masters for a public audience. The message was clear. Modern British art was on a par with the old European masters. And it is perhaps not a surprise that paintings like the Pre-Raphaelites were so popular in the Manchester show. In an attempt to demystify art, the Pre-Raphaelites consciously moved away from the grand manner of the old masters like Raphael their references were more accessible to a less traditionally learned audience. They depicted scenes from well-known English legends and history, Shakespeare or the hugely popular poet Tennyson. But their real hallmark is creating this dreamlike intensity with the use of vivid colours and minute attention to detail, which was very seductive. The pre-Raphaelites affronted the classical taste of the aristocracy. But this contemporary art was just what the new generation of collectors was looking for. Freed from the shackles of tradition, they wanted something different. This new collector had the money and confidence to buy what he liked, not what he was supposed to like. He was a man of the people and wanted to buy popular art, not the kind of art associated with the old world elite. He was the self-made millionaire who had profited from Victorian progress and he was looking to give something back to society on his own terms. Few people epitomise this kind of collector more than Thomas Holloway, pharmaceutical entrepreneur and founder of Royal Holloway College in Surrey. 
master of his universe. Once he decided to do something, Thomas Holloway made it happen. He didn't start buying art until he was 81, and then he built up the whole collection in just two years. When the college was first founded, it was for women only. Today, it admits men as well. The story of how Holloway created the wealth to establish his collection is a classic tale of Victorian progress from rags to riches. Social historian Jane Hamlet is a lecturer at the university and has researched Holloway's life. Holloway was from relatively humble origins. His father had been in the Navy, and then he ran a series, he had a series of pubs, and I think he ended up as a grocer in Penzance. So that was really Holloway's background. He came from a small business sort of merchant family, um, which would have encouraged him to be quite enterprising. But I think there's no clue there to how, how big he sort of eventually became. And when do you think he started making his money? Um, well, um, initially he actually wasn't all that successful. Um, he set off. He set up as a merchant in London, um, and he hit on um, the idea of marketing pills and ointment. And what he was very keen on was advertising his pills and ointments and at first he advertised steadily in the times but this didn't work at first and he got into debt in fact he himself was in debtors prison for a short spell in the 30s thanks to this advertising but actually he really stuck to it and when he came out again he went back to it and eventually it paid off in a, in a very major way so these are obviously some of the examples of his advertising free advice um, yes. Holloway pills. <laughs> yes, here we have a fantastic advert offering to purify the blood and for shortness of breath with weakness. And female really... complaints. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a large and generic yeah. category in the 19th century. Um, Absolutely. Yes. So what are these that you've got here? Well, they're um, a series of collecting cards which we think were made for children. And you can see that they've got this beautiful colour illustration on the front. They're showing different birds and different natural phenomena. Um, but when we turn them over, we can see that uh, we have an explanation of what the illustration shows, but also rather a large advert <laughs> for um, Holloway's pills and ointment. Yes, two-thirds advertising, yes. really. By the early 1870s, he'd acquired a huge amount of money and he didn't really know what to do with it. Um, and so it's at this point um, he actually advertises um, in The Builder, asking what a philanthropist should do with a million pounds. It's quite an interesting new class of person, actually, isn't it, who's prepared to donate a huge sum of money, really, for somebody else's benefit. Yes, yes, it is interesting, and he was a great philanthropist, and actually what he wanted to do was partly, I think, to give some, something back, but also by founding institutions that bore his name, he was, of course, ensuring that he would be remembered um, for a long time to come. The college is a remarkable legacy, but what's fascinating to me is that at the heart of the college, Thomas Holloway decided to create a picture gallery. Education for women was still controversial, so having an art collection would lend it weight and status. Holloway bought in bulk and at speed, and the collection was made up of art as modern and British as the man himself. This is Thomas Holloway's picture gallery, and walking through it is like walking through the pages of a book on Victorian art, because there are brilliant examples of every genre of painting popular with collectors of the time. There are history paintings and Bible scenes, grand Victorian narrative paintings, which look almost like stills from a film. Social realism, like this one, Frank Hole's Newgate committed for trial, Maybe it appealed to Holloway because of his own experience in the debtor's prison. And these typical Victorian landscapes, depicting the rural idyll of pre-industrial Britain. There are all sorts of paintings here, but for me, the unifying factor is that they all appeal directly to the emotions. Each painting evokes an immediate response which is what made them so satisfactory for a man who wanted value for money in his pictures. 
This painting is called Sympathy by Breton Riviere. It's apparently the most popular painting in the collection today, and it's really easy to understand why, because it's just so sweet. The little girl has been sent in disgrace to sit on the step, accompanied by her dog. We might be tempted to dismiss it as an overdose of Victorian sentimentality, but it is actually really well painted. In fact, the harsh critic, John Ruskin, even went as far as to say that the carpet looks as if it's been laid by Veronese. I'm not sure what I think about that, but it is wonderful on the detail and the finish. I mean, look at the little girl's face. Her eyes are actually welling up with tears. And of course, detail and finish were highly prized by the Victorian collector because they were a testament to hard work and effort. Holloway created this collection through his own hard work and effort. And as a self-made man, he had immense confidence in his taste. This rather gruesome painting by Lancia, which depicts the tragic loss of Sir John Franklin's expedition to navigate the Northwest Passage, was the most expensive in the collection. Holloway paid a record auction price of £6,615 the equivalent of half a million pounds today, and in so doing, raised a few eyebrows in the established art world. Ironically, for the most expensive painting, it certainly isn't the most popular today. This dramatic painting shows the futility of human effort in the face of the destructive forces of nature. The two polar bears tear at the remnants of the expedition. There's no sentimentality here. In fact, during exam time, it's said to bring bad luck, so the students apparently cover it up with a Union Jack. Whether the picture brings bad luck or not, for the rest of the year at least, the students here have the benefit of one individual's commitment to collect art. Thomas Holloway wasn't the only one collecting in this way. Other rich individuals were establishing or bequeathing collections for the public to enjoy, and municipal art galleries graced most cities in Britain by the end of the 19th century. But the modernizing Britain had an impact on the countryside too. As the 19th century progressed, some old English aristocratic families were beginning to struggle to maintain their estates, and family treasures were put up for sale. Now, some of the newly rich began to take advantage of British pictures coming onto the market. Family portraits that had once been personal commissions intended to reflect the status of dukes and lords were now available to buy. And one of the beneficiaries of this was the great European banking dynasty, the Rothschilds. In the 1870s, the Duke of Marlborough sold off some of his land here in Buckinghamshire, and it was bought by Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, who then set about building himself a veritable palace to art. From the outside, Waterton looks like a fabulous chateau in the Loire Valley rather than a traditional English country house. It also has a very different story to tell. Unlike the grand houses of the 17th and 18th centuries, the lifetime's work of successive generations, this fabulous house, with its equally extraordinary collection, was created by Baron Ferdinand from nothing in just seven years. The outside is impressive, but inside the feeling of opulence is heightened. The Prime Minister Gladstone's daughter wrote when she visited the house, that she felt oppressed with the extreme gorgeousness and luxury. The Rothschilds were one of the richest and most powerful families in Europe in the 19th century and made their fortune as bankers to monarchs and governments. Ferdinand himself was born in Paris, raised in Frankfurt and Vienna, and then settled in England in 1859. Collecting was in his family DNA. 
When Ferdinand wrote his reminiscences, he dedicated a chapter to his art collecting, which he called bric-a-brac, and in it there's a wonderfully evocative description of his early motivation for collecting. As a child, he was allowed to help his father pack up their art collection when they went to their summer house. And he writes, It was my privilege on these occasions to place some of the smaller articles in their old leather cases, and then again in the winter to assist in unpacking them and rearranging them in their places. Merely to touch them sent a thrill of delight through my small frame. Between them, the five branches of the Rothschild dynasty owned 40 great treasure houses spread across Europe, including seven in Buckinghamshire itself, making them the greatest collectors of the 19th century. But what is important about the Rothschilds is not just the fact that they amass so much, but that they established a distinct individual taste. Different from the conventional classical taste of the British aristocracy, and from that for contemporary art shared by many British industrialists. 150 years later, Ferdinand's collection is still intact, and the current Lord Rothschild is the custodian of this extraordinary collection. It's really clear from the whole house that Baron Ferdinand was passionate about collecting, but do you think it was a lifelong passion for him? What had happened to him, sadly, was that his wife had died in childbirth mm -hmm. and the child died as well. So Ferdinand was left on his own and um, eccentrically, to console himself, he built this enormous house as a kind of vehicle within which he could collect. And that's what he spent the rest of his life doing. He clearly had a very defined taste, which has come to be known as Le Goo Rothschild. Yes. Well, I think what happened was that the Rothschild family made money in the first half of the 19th century. And then the second half, they started to spend it. Mm -hmm. And they were all very close with one another. And very often, if there was a collection that came up for sale, they were kind of hunters of pack and divide it up or buy it together. And gradually there emerged, therefore, a kind of goo Rothschild. This combination, which is a bit odd, of mm. French 18th century furniture with English portraits. But then if you think about it, it's perhaps not so surprising because they were, I think, anxious to assimilate themselves into the English countryside, built these seven big houses in Buckinghamshire, and to show that they were kind of part and parcel of English life, they collected English 18th century portraits like Reynolds, like Gainsborough, like Rumley, and wanted to show those in conjunction, if you like, with their roots, which were more continental. This is the red drawing room. It's the central room in the house, and it's the first that would have been visited by guests, so it's really like a showpiece room and it epitomizes the taste for which the Rothschilds became famous. That striking combination of 18th century English pictures set against 18th century French furniture and decoration. Here we've got portraits by Gainsborough and Reynolds, but they're hung in a room full of French furniture and textiles, all the best of their kind. This carpet was commissioned by Louis XIV himself for the Louvre Palace, and the furniture was made for the French royal family. Wadston also benefited from the sales of the great British aristocratic collections. One of Ferdinand's purchases from the Duke of Hamilton's sale was this beautiful Gainsborough portrait of the 10th Duke, a famous collector himself. But it's another Gainsborough which was a particular favourite of Ferdinand's. This Gainsborough is known as the Pink Boy, and it really sums up what I think would have appealed to Ferdinand. With this painting, he was buying into a long tradition of English portraiture. Gainsborough was noted for often painting his sitters in Van Dyck costume, and there's a really strong similarity between the costume worn by this boy and the costume worn by Charles II when he was painted as a boy by Van Dyck. But the charming thing about this portrait is the informality. 
This is not some great heir to an aristocratic family standing in front of some grand building. This boy looks as if he's just paused for breath while playing in that wild Gainsborough landscape behind. You might have been a bit sensitive hanging someone else's family portraits on your wall. But with this more anonymous pink boy, Ferdinand was able to enjoy all the charm and fluidity of Gainsborough's best portraits, purely as a painting. Um, so yeah, it's all... Ferdinand himself died childless, but clearly Wadston was a passion which not only dominated his life, but which he hoped would be a lasting legacy. He kept a record of the building and contents of the house in a beautifully bound red book. So it's a great record. There's a rather interesting end on <clears throat> page 11 about what he felt about the future oh, of the house. Oh, that's fascinating. And in a sense, it uh, spurs on the present generation, because mm. what he says is, a future generation may reap the chief benefit of a work, which to me has been a labour of love, though I fear that Wadson will share the fate of most properties whose owners have no descendants. May the day be yet distant when weeds will spread over the gardens, the terraces crumble into dust, the pictures and cabinets cross the Channel or the Atlantic, and the melancholy cry of the nightjar sound from the deserted towers. So he, he was very concerned that it should be kept too. together. And so, mm. presumably, then, it's very important to you to keep the collection together and in the house. Yeah, I mean, sentimentally, it's important. Um, you know, I was left responsibility to keep it going, which I happen to enjoy very mm. much. And what I've tried to do is not just to make it um, the collection that it was, but also to add um, pieces to the collection which complement it and indeed add to it. Woodston is, above all, an ensemble and the whole is much more than the sum of its parts. You may find similar objects and paintings in museums, but there's something extraordinary about seeing them all together in the building for which they were bought. In many ways, Wadston is unique, but that's part of its importance. By the end of the 19th century, it was the freedom of individual taste that was shaping art collecting in Britain. The 18th century fashion for grand tour taste had given way to a new eclecticism which was bringing art and styles to this country which would never have come here without them. And often, to be slightly outside the traditional establishment helped. The coal valleys and industrial ports of Wales feel a long way from an art museum in London. But it was wealth from these places that allowed two Welsh sisters, Gwendolyn and Margaret Davis, to go against the prevailing taste of the day and become the advocates for a branch of avant-garde French art. Impressionism. Monet's water lilies are now so widely loved and admired, it's difficult to imagine that when the Davis sisters were buying these, most other British collectors were dismissing them as pointless blobs of colour. Gwendolyn and Margaret were so ahead of their time in appreciating the beauty of these paintings and recognising the value of this extraordinary new artistic movement. They collected paintings by Renoir, Van Gogh, Cezanne, all the great names of Impressionism. How was it that two sisters in Wales at the beginning of the 20th century were amongst just a handful of people buying Impressionist work in Britain? The two sisters were the daughters of a wealthy industrialist Welsh family. Like Thomas Holloway, they came from new money. Their grandfather had started life as a carpenter, but eventually formed a company which transported coal from pits in the Rhondda Valley to ports around the world. Gwendolyn and Margaret's father inherited the business, but he died aged only 45 and left his considerable fortune to be divided up equally between his son and two daughters. The girls grew up here in Plas Dinam, a large country house in mid-Wales. 
Gwendolyn and Margaret were very aware of their Welsh heritage and came from a deeply patriotic family. It was a non-conformist religious household, strictly teetotal, and the girls were instilled with a strong sense of duty to use their wealth for the benefit of others. But it would be misleading to imagine that they had a totally sheltered rural Welsh life. They were privileged children. They briefly went to boarding school in London, and at home in Wales, they would play tennis and ride horses. They had a governess, Jane Blaker, who accompanied them on trips round the London museums and galleries, and later went with them on their travels in Europe. In 1907, Gwendolyn came into her inheritance, and Margaret two years later. They were said to be the wealthiest unmarried women in Britain. And almost as soon as they inherited, they indulged in their passion for art. They made a point of travelling through Italy, seeking out the old masters, but they never really looked to acquire any. With quiet self-confidence, they kept an open mind to develop their own taste. This is Margaret's diary from her trip to Italy in 1909. And clearly, like many other British travellers before her, she was completely seduced by Venice. She writes really beautifully with a very artistic eye. Here, the water, quite calm, seems to be made up of several different colours. Here it is blue, there again green. Further on, it seems a shade of mauve. It could be a description of a Monet painting. And in fact, just a year before Margaret's trip, Monet himself had been to Venice. It's perhaps not surprising that some of the Davis sisters' earliest Impressionist acquisitions were Monet's views of Venice. Curator Beth McIntyre has charted the sisters' development as collectors. So did the sisters start off in, uh, collecting Impressionists straight away, or did they have to break themselves in gently? They really start buying in earnest in about 1908, but they don't acquire Impressionists at that stage. They, uh, they're looking at other artists, artists who are pretty well established, artists who are known in Britain, such as Turner, you know, the big names. And here's one of the Turner receipts that we have. So and this again, is the, price, the morning yeah. after the wreck. Well, Turner's very expensive. In yeah. fact, it, they, they spent more on works by Turner than any other artist. So when do you think they really started collecting Impressionist painting? Well, we know quite specifically, actually, when they turned to, towards buying Impressionism. We have this letter here, which is from Hugh Blaker. Hugh Blaker was one of their advisors. He was actually the brother of their governess, Jane Blaker, but was himself an art historian. And um, he advises the sisters, and he also acts on their behalf. And in this letter, which is dated August the 11th, 1912, we can read, I will certainly keep my eyes open in Paris for anything good, and I'm delighted that you think of getting some examples of the Impressionists of 1870. Very few English collectors, except Hugh Lane, have bought them at all. That's wonderful to have that letter. Yeah, so this really yes. marks quite a, a change in their mm. collecting and uh, a new direction. Mm. And from that time on, from 1912, we see them spending a lot of money, particularly um, on the French works, mm. on the Impressionist works. They're looking out for other artists such as Sisley, Pissarro, Renoir. So we think that the sisters wrote with a list of artists that they wanted to acquire, and he's suggesting some others. So that's incredibly so, forward-looking, isn't it? For it is. It's, it's for very forward-looking, and it's very forward-looking within England or within mm. Britain, but within Wales, I would think it's yes. pretty much unique. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. So within the next few years, after 1912, they, they buy um, eight Monets, I think, yes. and um, works by Renoir, works mm. by Rodin, Manet, you know, a, a lot of artists. But it's very interesting for us that we have the receipts so that we can compare prices. Mm. Because obviously some of the Impressionists at this stage were still not demanding the top dollar figures that they do nowadays. So here we have the receipt for the Monets, the three water lilies that they purchased in one acquisition um, in 1913. And all of those three purchases you can see for 3,000 £370. So that's incredible. 
I think that's what's so fascinating about these sisters, because they were really sure of their own taste. They were. Well, they, they went about putting a collection together very much with their own taste in mind. Mm. As collectors at the time, they were revolutionary. They championed a whole new movement. They were in going in a, in a new direction, mm. and one that was yet to be fully accepted within Britain. And extraordinary that it was two women who did this. Yes, and that's very important as well, I think, for the history of um, female collectors. This striking painting, Renoir's La Parisienne, really stands out in this collection. It shows a sophisticated lady elegantly dressed in blue, and she holds the viewer directly in her gaze, the mark of a truly independent woman. I love to think of this appealing to these two pioneer women collectors. And it's rather fitting that they should have bought it on the eve of the outbreak of the First World War, which was to have such an impact on the lives of women in general, and in particular, on those of the Davis sisters. Frustrated at observing the suffering of the war from a distance, in 1916, Gwendolyn volunteered at the London Committee of the Red Cross. She was sent to Troyes, just outside Paris, where she managed a cantine des Dormes Anglaises. The idea was to provide coffee, snacks and cigarettes to the French troops. The women who joined had to fund themselves, so were all middle class. Some even took maids with them. And most had probably barely made a cup of coffee before, let alone survived on the front line of a war. Margaret joined Gwendolyn in France in 1917 and threw herself into the work with her sister. It wasn't easy and the front line gradually edged closer towards them. Despite all the difficulties of the war, the sisters retained their passion for art. A more liberated attitude towards women was developing and Gwendolyn seized the opportunity to travel alone to Paris. There, she browsed the galleries and continued to buy paintings, including two wonderful landscapes by Cézanne. While the war ushered in a more progressive attitude towards women, the London art establishment was still not ready for the modern art that Gwendolyn brought home. The sisters had always been very generous, loaning their works to everyone from the local WI to national museums. But when Gwendolyn offered to loan this Cézanne landscape, the François Zola Dam, to the Tate, she was turned down. There are some colourful documents that record the reaction. At that stage, there were no Cézanne paintings on display in the national collections. Um, and through Hugh Blaker, they offered to lend two paintings to them. And here we can see the reply um, that the Tate or the National Gallery Board had met and expressed their thanks, but unfortunately decided not to accept the loan of the works by Cézanne. So uh, they turned <laughs> they turn them, <laughs> they turn them down. They turned them down. My goodness. And um, Blaker, yeah. who's acting for the sisters here, then writes to Gwendolyn Davis, and we have the enclosed from Aitken. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely disgusted. The excuse <laughs> of no space is not justifiable. They could easily haul down a mancini or something and hang these two <laughs> pictures in its place. So this country is still unique in having no examples of Cézanne in its national collections. Hopeless. Hopeless. <laughs> Despite the purchases of the Cézannes after the war, the sisters' collecting slowed down. Although many women in Britain had lost loved ones, Few had seen the destruction and horror the war had caused firsthand. Increasingly, Gwendolyn especially found it hard to reconcile the indulgence of collecting with the social deprivation and need in the 1920s. After the war, the sisters' focus changed from collecting art to setting up a centre for the promotion of arts in Wales. And they did that here at Greganic Hall, they bought this house in 1920, and although it became their home and housed the collection, its main purpose was to be a cultural centre to promote art, 
music and social change in Wales. Imagine this house deep in rural Wales, full of Impressionist paintings. That's how it would have been when the Davis sisters lived here. These were two remarkable women. Not only did they build a revolutionary collection, but they also made a place here at Kraganog where artists, writers, politicians and musicians could come and discuss ideas and be inspired. The sisters didn't completely abandon collecting, but by 1924, the majority of their buying of Impressionist painting was done. Gwendolyn died in 1951, but Margaret lived on until 1963. It was entirely in keeping with Gwendolyn and Margaret's life that on their deaths, they left their collections as a whole to the National Museum of Wales. Gwendolyn once said, the great love of collecting is doing it yourself, with expert opinion granted, but one does like to choose for oneself. And to me, that's what's so wonderful about this collection. It still has a really personal flavour. Gwendolyn and Margaret Davis are great examples for how private collectors have shaped the history of art of a nation. As private buyers, they can afford to take risks and follow their own paths. And it's thanks to great collectors like these that Britain is home to such unique and extensive range of art collections. Over 400 years, British private collectors have helped to move the history of art in this country. From pioneer collectors in the 17th century, whose travels overseas brought back Italian old masters and introduced the light of the Renaissance to Britain's dark shores. To the golden age of collecting in the 18th century, when stately homes dedicated to art spread across the countryside and the aristocracy imported the finest continental art in unprecedented quantity as well as patronizing new emerging british artists finally it was thanks to private collectors that in the 19th century art moved from being enjoyed in the exclusive drawing rooms of the aristocracy to being shared in public galleries. Private collectors have profoundly influenced the taste of a nation and their connoisseurship, passion and commitment to collecting has hugely contributed to the rich and diverse art heritage that Britain boasts today. Many of the paintings collected and commissioned by great British collectors are now in public ownership. To find out more, visit www.bbc.co.uk forward slash your paintings.